<sighs> okay. So let's talk a little bit about what we're experiencing right now. And this is, you know, for us, a once in a lifetime type of thing. So there are uh, seven different types of coronaviruses that exist in the world right now, for at least for humans. And um, four of them you may have actually had previously because the coronavirus is the common cold virus. So a lot of us were exposed to a version of a coronavirus previously when we just had a viral infection and the doctor told us, you know, there's nothing to do. Just go and, you know, uh, make sure you're hydrated and take over the counter medications and stuff like that to... Uh, to manage it. So there were definitely situations where we were exposed to it. Then there were three coronaviruses that are da very dangerous. Um, there was SARS a few years back, right? Sudden acute respiratory syndrome. Started the same thing, started in China, made its way around the world. Okay. And um, hold on one second. Somebody's chatting, trying to get in, no audio. Uh, okay. That's uh, Armando. Um, I'm just going to tell him it's on his end because it's working here. Armando needs it in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Oh, I typed the wrong person. I'm sorry. Okay, whatever. We'll figure out with Telemondo. Um, so there was SARS. You know, I, I'm sure everybody kind of remembers it. As far as the our side of the the ocean, it was really Canada got hit pretty hard with SARS. In fact, the Toronto EMS system, I'm just going to mute everybody because it's a little background noise. The, um, the Toronto EMS system actually got shut down because they didn't know what they were facing and they contaminated themselves and exposed themselves and stuff like that. Kind of what happened in, the, in Washington state with that fire department that was in the jurisdiction of that nursing home there that the, uh, was kind of epicenter of the one in, uh, in uh, Washington. Then you have something called MERS, M-E-R-S, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which still at times pops up in the Middle East. Um, and it's also a very effective killer, okay, just like SARS was. And then we had this one. This is another SARS um, virus, uh, but it's, it's because it's different than the original SARS. They called it COVID-19. So it's actually SARS-COVID-19. And it's called what they call a novel virus, which means it's never been seen in, you know, in mankind before. So that means that none of us have immunity to it, okay? Even if you had the common cold viruses and even if you had SARS and even if you had MERS, okay, and you survived it, um, you have no immunity to this virus. And that's, you know, one of the big issues that we're, we're facing right now, okay, um, with the virus. So we know that it started in China. A big question of when it did start, you know, I mean, was it December? Was it November? You know, nobody knows exactly because, you know, obviously things were kind of uh, kept quiet and stuff like that. But, and there's some people that even believe it, you know, it may have been in America as early as in November and December, because there are a lot of people who remember having flu-like symptoms, were tested for regular flu for influenza and uh, were negative. Okay. So they had flu-like symptoms earlier and they were negative. Okay. And um, so, you know, it could possibly have been here as early as, you know, uh, December or even before that. Okay. And what happens with a, this was, you know, as, as all viruses, this was a, a virus that started in an animal. They're not sure if it was a bat or a small uh, mammal that they sell in an open air food market. Okay. In, uh, in this Wuhan city of Wuhan, China. And it's basically a big market where there's people interacting with live animals in cages, handling them, you know, all day long and stuff like that. And, um, you know, somehow the virus was able to jump from a, a person, from, sorry, from an animal to a person. So that's the first step that a virus has to make to become dangerous to humans. And it did that, okay. And then the second step is that it has to be able to then jump from person to person very effectively. And it, it did that, obviously. It spread, you know, inside of China pretty quickly. And then once it got, you know, inside of China, it spread outside of China because of international travel and stuff like that. So that's kind of what, uh, you know, what happened there. So it's a viral infection, which means antibiotics are useless in treating it, okay? They're trying to work on antiviral medications like Tamiflu and stuff like that that may be useful. There's some anecdotal information that some, you know, malaria medications may be useful and this may be useful, but those are all anecdotal. There's no studies. There's no nothing saying that it's 100% uh, possible. Obviously, a lot of drug companies are working on treatments and also working on, you know, vaccines and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I don't know when it's going to, um, to do it. Um, so, I'm sorry, just people are texting. Um, questions and stuff. Okay, so we know that in America it started in, um, you know, in Washington and made it way, made its way across pretty quickly and stuff like that. So, so now what? 
Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, so again, it's a SARS virus, right? So you see as far as signs and symptoms, the typical flu-like symptoms. Now there's a couple of things that are interesting to, um, you know, to this virus, okay? Um, which is that there's also, some people are getting a lack of smell and a lack of taste as a uh, sign and symptom. Okay. And that's not so uncommon when you have an upper respiratory infection because the mucus is coating your, your taste buds and stuff like that. But that's just another thing you may see, you know, added to it. There are people who just get very mild symptoms and are, are okay in a day or two. But we know that it does hit certain people very hard, mainly people over the age of 60, 65 with pre-existing medical conditions. But there are also a lot of young, healthy people who you know, got it and are actually, you know, on ventilators and stuff. So there's no rhyme or reason of who gets it bad or not. But just statistically, it does tend to hit, you know, older people with comorbidities. Um, it also hits um, cigarette smokers harder. It hits people who vape um, harder, like the e-cigarettes, harder and stuff like that. So, you know, those are just some, you know, things to be aware of. I've been telling everybody, um, you know, just this is me personally, if, you know, if you're really over the age of, say, 60, maybe 55, 60, um, and even, you know, I would kind of lay off going on ambulance calls right now. I would let the younger people do it. Not that I'm saying we have to sacrifice the younger people, but um, they have a better chance of getting this and, and not getting very sick from it, where it seems to be hitting the older people. So if you've done your time and you're older or maybe, you know, you're not older and you got comorbidities and illnesses and stuff like that, or you're a smoker, I think this is a time to, you know, maybe step back and let other people do it. And that's just really my personal opinion. But, um, you know, that's what's kind of happening, you know, right now. Now, what happens to these people, you know, as far as their, their illness and stuff like that, or like how, how do they actually um, die? So again, this is just talking about, you know, what, what risk groups and stuff like that. And we'll talk about, um, how we protect ourselves in a second. But what, how these people are actually dying um, is that they're either getting a pneumonia from it, okay, which is, you know, obviously a very serious lung infection, or they're getting something called, or they, they may be getting a pneumonia and the second thing, which is called ARDS, A-R-D-S, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And what happens in ARDS is that the permeability of their blood vessels increases. So when you talk about permeability, you're talking about, hold on one second, Steve's trying to get in. When you're talking about permeability, you're talking about the capillaries, right? So capillaries are the smallest blood vessels. There's, you know, millions of miles of capillaries in your body. You can't see them or anything like that. They're paper thin, microscopic paper thin, and they have the ability to let things in and out. And that's what permeability is, is the term for, letting things in and out of the blood vessels. And obviously they're letting sugar and oxygen and taking carbon dioxide in and stuff. And what happens when somebody goes into this ARDS, okay, is that it's an overstimulation of their immune system, okay? So, and their immune system secretes certain chemical substances that increases the permeability of the capillaries. And what happens is, you know, you have the air sacs at the bottom of your bronchioles called your alveoli, right? So only thing that should be in your alveoli, obviously, is air, okay? Wrapped around the alveoli is a, a very extensive network of pulmonary capillaries. So who's vaping while we're watching this, Rob? It's a big risk factor. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, oh, cigarette. Okay. That's much better. Sorry. 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 <laughs> Frank, I actually have a, I have a question. I, I know you just said that, like, you know, um, people are believing that this has hit the United States as early as November. Like, I feel like I kind of had a little touch of something. Yes. That I could, knew it wasn't the flu there, and wasn't bronchitis. Yeah. There's no um, way of knowing. They're coming out with a new test that's gonna test for antibodies. So that will be the test you would take because if you were exposed to this particular virus, you would have developed and survived, you would have developed antibodies so that you have now supposedly 100% immunity from ever getting again. So the okay, only- Yeah, that was gonna be my next question. So is there a chance, like even if I had like a slight touch of it, like getting it a second time in a year? So the answer should be no, if it's a typical friendly? virus, right? It should be no. If you had, if it's a, if it's a typical viral infection, should be no, but there was some anecdotal information coming out of China where they said people had it, and recovered and got it a second time. No, the World Health Organization is not certain that that happened. They're not sure if maybe the person had a, a slight recovery, you know, like a day or two of feeling better and then relapsed, versus actually okay. catching it a whole second time. But the only way you will know if you were exposed to it is when they come out with this antibody test because the test they're doing right now will only test if it's active in your body at the time of the test. 
So, True. you know, so that's no. what you're going to wind up having to do when that becomes, uh, you know, becomes available. Okay. So this ARDS um, type of situation, right? So what basically happens, I said, is you have your alveoli where the air comes in and wrapped around the alveoli is an extensive network of pulmonary capillaries. Okay. And that's where your oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange take place. So that's, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be and everything like that. What happens is if the permeability of the capillaries increases now, the plasma, the fluid portion of the blood, flows out of the capillaries and flows into the alveoli. And again, the only thing that's supposed to be in the alveoli is air. So what happens is the person drowns from the inside out. So they call it a dry land drowning. And this is where CPAP and ventilators and all this stuff come into a role of, of helping these patients. But, okay, I don't think that's something that we that should be doing in the field. We do not have the right protective equipment. We don't have the right filters and everything like that to go on and do anything. So right now, probably most of what we're doing from a, a, a COVID-19 patient standpoint is transport. Okay. If you're going to do a nebulizer, which is probably the highest risk procedure you could do on these patients, you have to have a special filter so that when they exhale out the nebulizer, you're not rebreathing it, right? Even with your mask on, there's such a huge viral load um, when they're doing a nebulizer, that it's really a, a, a recommendation not to do it unless you're, you know, in a totally negative pressure room and you have a PAPR system on versus just an N95 mask. So, you know, most of what you're going to see going on now is really just transport. Transport with protection, okay? And we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, so I'm going to unmute everybody for a second. Does anybody have any questions on what happens to these patients and like how they die and stuff? And obviously there's always a possibility of getting a secondary sepsis, you know, type of situation, you know, but mainly what's happening is it's either in the pneumonia, okay, or it's going to the ARDS. And you have to remember that there's so many patients, that these patients now are being told to stay home. So that by the time they call 911, well, you get some that call 911 when they don't need to. And we are doing phone triage now where the police are talking to them on the phone and giving us their phone numbers where we could talk to them right from the parking lot, you know, or their driveway and kind of see what's going on. And a lot of times we've been successful in telling patients um, not to even, that they don't need to go to the hospital. And we'll talk about the ramifications of that in a second. Okay. But Frank, I got a yes. question for you. Mm -hmm. Frank? Yes, Steve. Um, did, you know, the, the, as far as talking to them through, you know, uh, the door or through the telephone from the front, the, looking at the, the guidelines that the health department sent us, it still made it look like at least somebody had to do an assessment by going inside. Yes. The thing this, that we're going to talk about that, I'm going to show that in a second. The state um, triage that they put out for, for pandemic viral infections is not very useful for us because you know, all they really did is tell us everything we know. They're not really protecting us. I'll tell you what's going on right now in the county. Like I said, a lot of people are taking almost a verbal RMA from patients. It's not the right way to do it, but it's probably the safe way to do it, okay, where they're talking to the patient on the phone and saying, listen, you know, you don't sound too bad. How do you feel? Getting some background information from the patient. Um, maybe looking at the patient through a window or, you know, through the door six feet away. And if the patient doesn't look very acute, they're telling them that it's probably safer for them to stay home, right? And I mean, they're not lying to them. They're probably safer for them to be home because what's going to happen if they go to the emergency room and they're not very sick? They're going to sit in a waiting room with a lot of other people like them. So if they don't have COVID-19, now there's a good chance they are going to get it, okay? And nothing's going to be done for them. They're going to sit in that waiting room for hours and hours and hours, you know, with nothing being done for them because, you know, you've seen what's going on in the emergency rooms. The emergency rooms are pretty full. So they're, you know, and we have that sheet that the state gave us now that hands them, which has some basic instructions on what people should do when they have a mild viral infection. Now, obviously, if they're toxic, you know, they're, they're going to, you know, wind up getting very sick, then we do have to go in and manage them and transport them. But for the most part, it's probably just going to be a nasal cannula under, an, under a surgical mask, right? You can't put an N95 mask on these patients, but a, a nasal cannula under a surgical mask and transport. There's not much else that we're really going to be doing for these patients because of, you know, the danger to us. Okay. And can I ask a question about liability? Okay. So we can't answer that because we are, everything we're doing right now, we're very liable. We are. Okay. Yeah, because the state did not put out anything saying, you know, that we could transport to alternate destinations, that we could not transport, that we could take a verbal RMA. They're do they, they gave us zero extra ability. 
So if you're telling somebody they could stay home without assessing them, without getting a signed RMA, and they agree, right? So maybe the patient's going to say, I'm not going to sign an RMA. I wanted to go to the hospital. You told me not to. You know, so, you know, that's the, that's when we go through that sheet, I'm going to tell you what the issues are, because the sheet basically says that if the patient wants to go to the hospital and you don't think they should go, to call medical control. So you think the medical control doctor is going to want that, you know, liability if they even have time to answer the phone? I mean, if you tried to call medical control recently, nobody's coming to the phone because they're so busy taking care of patients. So they're yeah, not- Yeah, they're barely even- the Yeah, they're not even going to, you know, they're not going to do it. So it's all back on us. You know, so if you feel that the liability to you is greater than the risk of COVID, then you're going to go in the house and you're going to fully assess the patient, you know, and you're going to listen to their lungs and tell them to exhale, which is, of course, dangerous. And, uh, you know, and then you're going to make a decision. And then, you know, if they need to be treated, you're going to go and give them an albuterol treatment, which, again, is very dangerous. So that's something everybody would have to decide, you know, on their own. You know, there's, there's, there's some states now that are not working COVID patients in cardiac arrest. So if you, they get there. And the patients with cardiac arrest are not working it because anything you do airway-wise is raising your risk factor greatly. So there's assuming if they're dead, you know, prior to arrival, that they're going to stay dead, you know, because the chances of bringing them back are pretty minimal already. Um, and in fact, that was our first EMS exposure um, in this county was a uh, guy who died of COVID, the first patient, you know, in Rockland County that died of COVID that was a cardiac arrest. And um, yeah. Hi, Marielle. Did you spell your name wrong on purpose to disguise yourself? So um, anyway, so that's what we're facing right now. Okay, so I'm going to, anybody have any questions as far as the pathophysiology or anything like that of what happens and, you know, how it's affecting us? Okay, so I'm going to mute everybody just so there's not a lot of background noise. And again, if you have a question, just unmute yourself. Okay. So what do we do to protect ourselves? What do we do to protect ourselves? Okay. So, you know, we, we want to be greater than six feet away from the patient, okay, at a minimum, but that really depends on the viral load in the room. So the viral load kind of means how much of the virus is floating in the air. So if you have a small room with a person coughing without a mask on them, the viral load is pretty high. So what you would need to do in that situation is open the window, Okay, if there's a fan, turn the fan on to try to dissipate the, the viral load of the virus. Now, obviously, the back of the ambulance is lethal, but in the back of the ambulance, we have the ability to turn the exhaust vent on. Okay, that's the vent up on the roof. And we have the ability, hopefully, through our air conditioning system to bring in fresh air, right? You hopefully have a, you know, a air conditioning system where it's just not recirculating the air. There's usually a, something you have to a switch you have to throw to bring in fresh air. Okay, the driver obviously up front should have the windows open or his air conditioning or her air conditioning on and close the door between the patient compartment and the, and the front compartment. Okay, so you don't want to be, you know, close to them, okay, without having an N95 mask on, without having goggles on, okay, because it can be spread with contact to the eyes. Um, a gown on, okay, or else you're going to have to change your clothing if you truly had a COVID patient, okay, and um, gloves, obviously. Okay. Now, you probably, they're going to tell you you don't need the double glove because it's not an Ebola type of thing where the fluids were so toxic. But I, personally, I've been double gloving just because when I pull the outer layer of gloves off, I still have a fresh pair of gloves underneath. So a lot of the stuff they're telling us now is just because we're running out of PPE and they're just trying to conserve PPE. Okay. Um, so let me go back over to the Hey, PowerPoint. Frank, I got a quick question. Yes. In um, are you all for this reusing our mask or do you see that as a problem? Or so it, dep it depends on the stock of your N95 masks, right? So, I mean, I assume everybody's talking about N95s, right? Because a surgical mask is not effective. The reason they're telling us we could use surgical masks if we don't have N95s is because it's better than nothing. But a surgical mask does not give you protection. A surgical mask should only go on the patient to reduce the droplet spread when they cough or sneeze, okay? Um, so if you're talking N95 masks, is it ideal to reuse it? The answer would be no, but it depends on your stock of N95 masks. So if you think you have enough N95 masks to last for the next six to nine months, um, then yeah, then I would you know, tell everybody as soon as they finish patient care to use a new mask. Now remember, those masks are only effective if they're fit tested and they're only effective if you have no facial hair. So if you have facial hair, you cannot be fit tested. Okay, so you have no protection from the mask. And if you weren't fit tested, you have no idea if you have the right mask on or not, the right size mask on or not. 
So it's better than nothing to have a mask on, obviously in those situations. But if you were then to file a, a claim, say with uh, workers comp, you know, and they, they look at your corpse and they see you had a, 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 you know, the medical examiner documents, you had facial hair, you know, your family's not going to get anything because they're going to say you placed yourself at risk by doing that. You know, most EMS agencies now are adopting a policy that if you have facial hair, you can't ride, you know, on the, uh, on the ambulance. Um, now, if it's a religious reason why you have facial hair, the agency is supposed to provide a PAPR type device for you, which is, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's kind of like a, a full helmet or full hood that the, where the person wears that has a uh, compressed air, not a compressed air, but a, a fanny pack that has a, uh, a fan system that's sucking the air, the outside air through filters and then running it up the hose into the hood or helmet. So it's much easier to work in because N95 masks are very, very hard to work in. The problem is you can't get them. You know, they're fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars for every unit and you can't buy them. They're gone. You know, they don't exist anymore. So but that would be the alternative if you have a member with facial hair um, that you would have to get one of those for them. Now, you don't have to buy one total unit for each person. Just the the helmet or hood, depending on which way you go, would have to be specific to the person. Um, so, no, the answer would be I would not reuse it. Um, although a lot of places are, uh, do not, if you had a patient like a low, a low risk patient, let's say you had somebody, I don't twisted their ankle, you know, you don't think there's anything with COVID. Um, you could reuse that, um, you could reuse that mask, just store it in a, uh, brown paper bag, not a Ziploc bag, um, brown paper bag, because it's going to be a lot of moisture in a mask after you use it even for a minute. And they found that when it goes into the, um, Ziploc bag, there's mold building up and stuff like that in the, uh, in the mask. So if you're going to reuse it, it gets stored in a brown paper bag. But again, I don't think it's ideal. Um, we do have people that are wearing masks constantly um, on every single, you know, all day long. And we tell them to wear the same mask if they're doing that, unless they have a high risk patient, you know, and then they should change it. Okay. Okay, so going back to what we're talking about, and again, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and stuff like that. So obviously, motor transmission uh, transmission is airway. Okay, there is a possible contact also. Okay, uh, but mainly it's airway. Um, as far as contact, the droplets can live on a surface for up to you know 24 hours, depending on the surface. They're saying paper, cardboard, cloth, like clothing, it can live for a lot longer than say uh, stainless steel, you know, metal, wood and stuff like that. So you do have to, you know, have both precautions. That's why we have a mask, goggles, and a gown and glove, right? So, and everything like that. Okay, um, as far as droplet infections go, the patient, right, to reduce the amount of sprayer in, in the air, okay, the patient should be wearing a surgical mask. They can't wear an N95 mask because they can't breathe through it, so they're only gonna get worse. Plus, we don't wanna, you know, uh, waste N95 masks on patients. And if you're going to give them oxygen, like you see in this picture here with this lady, okay, the, the oxygen cannula goes under the surgical mask, and that's probably the safest way to go. For a while, they were saying non-rebreathers, but they're really saying now that the non-rebreather doesn't contain the uh, droplets the way the surgical mask does, okay? Now, in the back of the ambulance, you know, I don't think you need to have two people in the back of the ambulance with the patient unless there's a, a need for patient care. So if you're running like a three-person crew, I would have one person in the back with the patient. I would have them, you know, try to sit at the captain seat and just constantly have conversation with the patient so they're not in front of the patient, they're behind the patient. You know, they can engage the patient in, in conversation. Even the patient can't answer. You know, they could tell them, you'll hold your hand up if you need me or something like that. And then I'd stick the other EMT or whatever, you know, in the, in the front with the driver because that's a safer place to vote. You should not be transporting. Frank, I got a question for you. One, one second. You should not be transporting any family members in the ambulance because they're not going to be allowed in the hospital and then you're going to be stuck with them. They're going to expect a ride back. The only uh, caveat to that is a pediatric patient, okay, is allowed one parent to come with them. A pregnant woman is not allowed to have a husband, mother, whatever with them. So it's only the pediatric patient. Um, and I guess you could be safe under 18 as far as peds go. I mean, I'm not sure if they do 16, but I would think they do 18. And then you could have one uh, guardian. But I would still tell them to take their own car because again, this person was in the house with the patient that you think has the COVID virus. So unless you're gonna give them a surgical mask to wear, you know, you don't really want them in your ambulance without you know, a surgical mask on. Okay, so who had a question? Me. Okay. Rob, okay. okay. So 
I had I just I just got off work. Um, I had a call earlier today. The husband called because the wife went up to Good Sam, was tested last Friday, hasn't received her results yet, mm-hmm. but was in was in acute respiratory distress. Her O2 sat was like 64. While we were talking to her and evaluating her, I realized the husband was also like five words and a gasp for air, five words and a gasp for air. So we evaluated him and found out that because the wife has been probably about 10 or 11 days now with dealing with this, his O2 sat was like 84. So what, what's your question? I took the both of them up to good Sam. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Now remember if you had proper PPE on, which means, you know, again, N95 mask that you were fit tested for um, goggles, gown and gloves, you are considered protected. Okay. And you do not have to self isolate. Okay. Now, if you had to break the seal on your mask around them and stuff like that, then you would be considered at risk. So you have to wear a surgical mask for 14 days and you have to self-monitor your temperature and for symptoms. If you come out down with a fever greater than 100.4 or any symptoms, then you have to self-quarantine and make arrangements to get tested. Okay, so that's the rule as far as that goes. Okay, yeah. Okay, now because, as far as- like I haven't like, I haven't learned an N95, but I have like a, uh, a full on, like full respirator, that's a P100. Okay, that's fine. With the uh, replaceable filters. Yep, that's fine. Okay, as far as deconning equipment and stuff like that, um, I don't know if you guys have some kind of fancy decon system. I don't know if Glenn Albin went out and you know spent thousands of dollars on some kind of fancy system, but they're still recommending that everything gets wiped down, okay, to remove any droplets on the surface before you go to any of those sprayer type systems. And anything, any wipe that says it's good for SARS is okay for COVID because COVID is a SARS uh, virus. Okay, so bleach, 10% bleach is fine, or any of the fancier ones is fine. And you should be wiping down all your equipment, okay? You know, so blood pressure cuffs, everything like that, stethoscopes. Um, Change your clothes after a true COVID call if you didn't have a gown on. Wipe your shoes down because your shoes are not covered with the the gown and stuff like that. So anything that possibly could have been contaminated. And then obviously very, very good hand washing. There's some fantastic videos um, showing hand washing. I know it sounds silly, but we really, none of us wash our hands the right way. And there's a great video that shows somebody with like a black dye. So he's washing his hands, his clean hands with a black dye. And it's, he's showing you how hard it is to get the black dye across every square inch of his skin on his hands. And if you go backwards, right, what they're trying to show you is how hard it is to wash off the virus. So if this guy spends, you know, almost a minute wiping his hands with this black dye, trying to get in every crevice, and he can't do it. It's the same thing when we're washing ourselves. Now remember, regular soap and water is the best. The water does not have to be hot. The only reason, you know, hot water is just more, or warm water is more comfortable, so you tend to wash for longer, but it, the hotness does has nothing to do with killing the virus. The soap does not need to be antibacterial because anything that's antibacterial is not gonna help on a virus anyway, right? It's, not, it's a bacteria versus a virus. So you really can't buy antibacterial soap anymore. Um, Anyway, they, don't, they found that it was just making the uh, bacteria resistant. But you don't need antibacterial soap, okay? Um, and you need to wash, you know, as per the different videos or CDC guidelines in a way that you're, you know, scrubbing your hands appropriately. If you have long fingernails, this would be the time to trim them down and try to wash them to your fingernails. The, ac- the alcohol-based cleansers like Purell and stuff like that are only if you cannot have access to water, which is, you know, a lot of times in EMS, we don't have access to it. But what they're finding with the alcohol-based is that it's drying everybody's skin out and they're getting cracks in their skin and stuff like that. And that's just another place for the virus to kind of tunnel in and hide. So they're recommending that if you're using a lot of the alcohol-based cleaner, that you um, use like a hand moisturizer as much as you can to keep your skin from drying out and cracking. Okay, so any questions so far on anything we talked about? Okay. No. Okay, so the incubation period, again, approximately one to 14 days, although they're questioning, you know, it may be even a little longer, okay. Testing issues. So we do have a, um, a testing site up, obviously, at Anthony Wayne. Um, some people call and they're told two or three days. Other people just drive up right up there without an appointment and they get seen as soon as they pull up. It's not being highly utilized right now, so you probably could drive right up. I would bring ID. They're, they're very, very nice to EMS. I would just bring ID, okay, and go up. If you're having a hard time, 
call me because we have a crew up there. Plus we have two or three guys that work for us that work for the state that are up there. And I've been fairly successful in getting uh, people in. Don't argue. Don't be disrespectful. Just say. Frank, you know, can I, can I, it's Marielle. Can I just hold on one second? Quick? Just hold on one second. So just, you know, don't be rude to them. Cause I had one guy that was very, very, very rude. And then when I asked for a favor, they were like, no, screw him. He was cursing at us. So, you know, if they say no, just pull away and call me and then we'll figure out how to get you in. Yes, Marielle. So, so I've been working up there the last week and a half since it opened okay. up. Um, and we, yesterday they had to turn away 40 FDNY guys. Um, there's no promises that members of service can get in anymore without that appointment. They've really cracked down on people just showing up. Okay. Um, doesn't is that, even is matter. Is that something really new? Service. Is that um, something uh, recent? Uh, the last two or three days. Oh, because I had somebody drove up there today and went right in. Okay. I guess oh. maybe it depends who you get because yesterday they turned away a whole a whole group of FDNY guys. Yeah, they should let them get tested in the city. So. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, I'm I'm all for testing members of service. We're the ones that are obviously you know right. first exposed to this. If anyone's going to get exposed, it's us. Right. But it it really depends who you get up there. It's not a guarantee. If you flash the ID, okay. you're going to get a spot. Okay. Just to keep that in mind. So if they do turn you away, don't take it the wrong way. <laughs> right. So I know like somebody just called now right before we started the CME and they were told the earliest they would get an appointment is Monday. So just so okay. you know, so it's yeah. Friday and they were told that their appointment is for Monday morning. And I'm not sure. I know they're testing on Saturdays, but I don't think they're testing on Sundays. Is that correct? We're there seven, no, so, we're there seven days a week. Seven oh, okay. to seven. Okay. So, yep. Okay. No problem. Okay. Um, I also believe Crystal Run over in West Nyack has a testing site too that just recently opened also. Yeah, but they were they were not taking people. We tried to send somebody the other day. They were not taking anyone um, who was not a previous patient of Crystal Run. So I don't know, you okay. know that's changed now that they got more tests and that changed, but that was the other day. I think that was like Tuesday. They weren't taking anybody. And we also sent uh, people to Partners in Safety and then they also started turning people away. They said they didn't have enough tests. So... Um, you know, the state, the state is the best way. I mean, my, they, the hospital made my wife go up there because she had five patients last week that she treated that all came back COVID positive and they made her go get tested. And uh, she, my wife got her results. She went on a Friday. She got her results on a Tuesday, um, you know, that she was negative and stuff like that. So, and that was even, she was wearing a spacesuit, and they still made her go get tested, but they let her come to work. They didn't want her to stay home. I thought she'd get some time off. They didn't want her to, to stay home. They, she just had to wear a surgical mask the whole time she was, uh, you know, in the office. Okay, so the CDC has some information out there if you want to go and read it and stuff. Um, they're revising it pretty much daily, and what they've done is they've kind of downgraded the level of PPE people need. That's not that, that it's they determine it's safer. It's that there's not enough stuff out there, and you you know you hear all the news conferences and stuff. Um, our county has been horrible with putting stuff out. Um, you know, they're holding that if people were not fit tested, they won't give it, they won't give it to the agency and stuff like that. We are the only county, as far as I know, I've sp sp spoke to people in Orange County and Sullivan County that they're, as they get PPE, they're distributing it, you know, based on your, what they call your burn rate, which is how much you use, um, you know, back to the agencies. But, you know, our county for some reason is sticking to, and, and they have a good argument, which is that, you know, obviously giving uh, PPE out without fit testing is, you know, making people not get fit tested. But, you know, I, I don't know. It depends on how you think about it. So we we finally uh, we're up to about 60% fit testing now. So we finally started getting some stuff uh, from the county, but it's drips and drabs. You know, it's not large amounts or anything like that. So um, you know, that's um, that's what's out there. And you know, it's it's not everything, right? You get a couple of masks, a couple of gowns, and stuff like that. Okay. So what else do we have? So we talked about, you know, the different things we could do, which is ensuring proper ventilation in the back of the ambulance. Okay. That we're going to clean with something that's approved with, um, uh, for SARS. Okay. So we just actually transported a patient today that was intubated. So we had to put them on one of the vents. And then there was a big question of what do you do with that vent? So fortunately, you know, the ventilators have a series of filters. So everything that was disposable, you're able to throw away, including the filters. And then we were told just to wipe down the outside of the vent with a, a bleach wipe and let it air dry. So we actually wiped it down twice. We wiped it down once and let it air dry with the bleach wipe. And then we did a second time and let it air dry. So it sat out there Question for can, a couple hours. Yes, Kyle? You mentioned the bleach wipes. Does that mean we should use those in place of the uh, purple top? Or No, anything bleach, 10% bleach is fine or anything that says it's good for SARS. 
So if you read the side of, I mean, I don't know which tubs people have and stuff, you know, because everybody, colors mean nothing, you know, it just depends on what the manufacturer decided to, to do. So you just have to read that it's good for, for SARS. If it says it's good for SARS, then it's fine for this one. Because again, this was a SARS variant type of, uh, you know, um, virus. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So again, in the back of the ambulance, have the vent venting to the outside. Don't worry that you're like a little COVID producing factory to the public because again, it comes down to viral load. So when you're blowing it out the top of the ambulance out into the atmosphere, the viral load is, you know, not there. It's just not enough for such a large area. So you're not infecting people unless they had their face over, you know, they were on the roof of your ambulance with their face over the vent. Um, and then you want fresh air coming in. So if you have an ambulance that still has windows that open, that's ideal. But if not, have your air conditioner not in the recycle mode, but in the fresh air mode. So it's bringing fresh air from the outside. Okay, again, cleaning stuff. So it has to be good for SARS, COVID type two. Okay, um, which you know most of the stuff is and everything like that. Okay, everything needs to get wiped down. Okay, not just the parts that the patient came in contact with, because obviously if they coughed, sneezed, it floated through the air and touched everything. So every part of the ambulance needs to get wiped down uh, to be able to do it. Okay. Um, this cleaning first always needed. What they're basically talking about is if you have any of these fancy machines that clean, they still you still have to wipe everything down first before you use that machine. Okay, so you know it's. I, I don't want to say it's not a benefit to have those kind of fancy machines, but it doesn't take away from the fact that you have to wipe everything down. Okay, so again, place the surgical mask on the patient if the patient needs oxygen, a nasal cannula underneath there. And this may be a situation if they really have a low pulse ox like Rob had, this may be a situation where you're going to exceed the six liters per minute that we normally do to try to get it to the, the pulse ox up. So you're going to titrate the oxygen administration to their pulse oximetry. And obviously, we know that we want to get their pulse oximetry if possible above you know, to 94%. That may not be possible no matter what you do if they're that congested, but that would, you know, be what you would be able to do. And yes, it probably will be uncomfortable to the patient and everything like that, but, you know, you have to, um, you know, treat their pulse oximetry as far as, you know, that type of thing. Okay. Frank, again, what's going on with, um, like, the, the high flow nasal cannula? Is, so, that, is, that a new, is that a thing that we're going to be doing soon? or The state didn't put it into the protocol. There's some talk about putting it into the ALS protocol. The problem is that it would exhaust. Remember when we had the old CPAP that we used to have to mainline into your oxygen tanks and it, it wasted your oxygen tank. And at, after the call, you had a, I'm talking your main oxygens, you know, on the outside. Of the yeah, animal. you killed your main on one job. Right. right. So it's the same thing. That's what that high flow is. Um, it's going to, it comes out at something like 50 liters per minute. So you would have okay. to have a whole special system to be able to use it. So, you know, it's, it's, it would be, I don't think the state will ever mandate it because you would have to go out and spend money. So the state tries not to mandate things that, you know, cause you to go out and spend money because most of the ambulance cores in New York state are, you know, not funded well. So, I mean, right now, part 800 doesn't even say you need an AED, an automatic external defibrillator. So it does say you need two bulb syringes, but it doesn't say you need an AED. Again, wow. again, because, because of the cost. Okay. So we talked about, again, surgical masks after the call, good hand hygiene, anything that you could do to reduce the, uh, the production of the droplets would be, you know, very important. Okay, so try to stay away from suctioning, intubation, um, um, nebulizers, and stuff like that, okay, because those are all very dangerous procedures for us to do in the, in the back of the ambulance, Okay. Um, the surgical mask versus the N95. N95 is the way you want to go, but if you ran out of N95s, the surgical mask is fine. If you're like in a, a hospital setting, let's say the driver, let's say you have a crew where you have three people. You have a driver and two EMTs or an EMT and a helper, and the driver is never going to come within six feet of the patient. He's just going to drive or she's just going to drive. Then they don't need an N95 mask. A surgical mask would be fine for them. Okay, so... I don't know if they're going to only want a surgical mask, but technically, if they're not within six feet of the patient and they're not involved in patient care, they don't need a uh, N95 mask. So that's what that's kind of about. Okay. Um, again, talking about the um, type of equipment. So we said again, an N95 mask, a gown, gloves, eye protection, the driver. Okay, as long as they have three feet here, but I would say six feet, and they're not involved in patient care, they can get away with a surgical mask. Okay, as as far as that goes, I wouldn't say no PPE because. I don't think it's fair that the driver, you know, doesn't wear anything, okay? Again, this is all about saving stuff. It's not about what's right for anybody, okay? So we talked about that. They say double gloves are not necessary. I think we have plenty of gloves. I would double glove personally, okay? Um, this is out there on the CDC's website on how to don, okay? There's also a similar one on how to wash your hands, okay? 
So exposure, what does exposure mean? Okay, so the healthcare provider was in close vicinity of the patient and doing any type of aerosol generating procedures, suctioning, um, puts an oral airway and causes the patient to cough and gag, you know, gives the patient a, um, a nebulizer. Those are all super high risk procedures, okay? Even with PPE on. But if you did have PPE on and it was fit tested and fit right and everything like that, you should be 100% protected, right? I mean, if everything was on right and you're fit tested for it, you should be 100% protected, okay? Um, medium risk, okay, are probably the family members and stuff like that who touch the patient or around the patient and with no PPE on. Okay, and then low risk is that you're, you know, far enough away from the patient or that the patient had a surgical mask on. Okay, um, so this is very dynamic. In other words, like what are we doing for people and stuff like that? It's changing as the, uh, as the days go on because they're just losing more and more healthcare providers. I mean, we first started, you know, like I said, those people who worked that code who had PPE on had a 14 day quarantine. They got a letter in the mail with a, a judicial order telling them that they were quarantined for 14 days. And if they were not in their house for 14 days, they got a $2,000 a day fine. Now they're telling different people with the same, actually probably worse exposure than these guys had, that they have to self-quarantine for seven days. You know, and then they're telling people who were protected, who are around COVID patients, that they don't have to self-quarantine at all. They just have to monitor their temperature and look for signs and symptoms and wear a, a surgical mask when they're around somebody else. So it's very dynamic just because we're running out of, you know, people able to, uh, to do things. Okay, so that's, so you would have to develop some kind of policy internally on, you know, what you, what you would want people to do and stuff like that. You know, I mean, and, you know, honesty is the best policy. Um, you would want people to disclose to you what the risk is. Like I, right before I said, I had a phone call from someone, you know, and she was around a patient and she said that tonight she developed a fever. And, um, you know, it was over 100.4 and she had some aches and pains. So we told her she could not come to work anymore, that she had to get tested. And that if she gets a negative test, okay, then she, you know, three days after a negative test, she can come back to work and she has to wear a mask. Okay. Um, so this is talking about, again, self-monitoring. Uh, there are some places that are taking the temperatures of their employees when they come to work and then throughout the day and when they leave work and stuff like that. Um, I, I chose not to do that here because what we found, we just did some random sampling of temperature. Um, depending on what the clothing that was the person was wearing, how hot the heat was in the car, how hard they were working out in the field, that we had people that were coming up with 99.9s, you know, 100s um, and stuff like that when they didn't really have a cold or a virus or anything like that. They were just hot. So we didn't do anything. Um, you know, part of the problem too is, I mean, picture your day tour shows up, right? You guys are running, I think, two two ambulances now. Your day your day tour shows up, and three out of the four people test, you know, have a fever. No symptoms, just a fever. You know, uh, and the fever is because they happen to be warm, but they have a fever, right? They 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 have an elevated temperature. So now, what are you going to do? You're going to take your EMS service, you know, out on that probability that maybe somewhere down the road they're going to develop it. So. In that case, probably just have them wear a surgical mask and continue to monitor their symptoms. And if their temperature does go sustained above 100.4 or they develop any other symptoms, then they should get pulled off. Okay. Again, work restrictions and stuff. So there's, you know, people are going to get paid. Um, workers comp, like if you do have an exposure, um, try to trace it back to the patient that you know uh, the crew was on. Because what worker comp, workers comp is going to do is they're going to trace it back to, you know, what patient spread it to them. So if every patient they took care of turned out to be COVID negative, then you know they're going to say that it wasn't actually a workplace exposure. So you know if somebody had a workplace exposure, you know a patient was positive, just retain that information. So quarantine we know is effective, right? I mean that's what kills, basically brings all viruses to an end if there's nobody new to infect. The problem is in America we're not used to it, right? And everybody wants to do what they want to do. Uh, personally, I think I do see a lot less people on the road and a lot less people out and about. So I think people are somewhat heating, you know, heating it. And obviously with schools being closed, that's very good. Um, so hopefully that will help, you know, bring it down. Realize that we are nowhere near the peak of it yet. Our peak will probably be somewhere three to four weeks from now when we'll have the peak uh, amount of, um, you know, calls and stuff. And then it'll start as the weather gets nicer, it'll start getting less. Um, the big question that the epidemiologists are asking is, do they continue? I'm just going to mute everybody. Um, and if you have to ask, just unmute yourself. The big question the epidemiologists are asking is, what do they do with school in September? So obviously, we know school is done for you know this semester. 
grade school, high school, college, everything is done for this semester. The big question is September, right? So historically what happens when they have viruses is that it dies out over the summer or it gets a lot less and the politicians bow to pressure and they open up the schools in September and then they have what's called the third wave. So the first wave we're having, it'll kind of peter out a little bit and we'll get a smaller second wave sometime in the summertime. And then if they let everybody go back to school and the kids start spreading it around again, then we get a third wave, which is usually as bad as the first wave. If you just study the history of pandemic, you know, viral infections. And again, most of this is obviously influenza when they get the different avian and swine flus and stuff like that. So I don't know what's going to happen, you know, as far as people, you know, not going to school in September, but that's, that would be the best way to ensure that the virus doesn't, you know, pop up again in the, uh, in the fall. Okay, so we said treatment wise, there's not a whole lot to do except over the counter type of stuff. Um, it's really treat the symptoms of the patient. So if they, the airway needs to be managed, it's, they're gonna wind up having the CPAP non-invasively if they're not too bad and intubation and ventilator if they are real bad. And usually it takes about a week to two weeks for them to stabilize, um, you know, in that situation. And obviously we're running out of ventilators, we're running out of, you know, critical care beds. Um, good Sam on Saturday took the old, di um, this, uh, this Saturday it opens up, but they took the old dialysis center and it is now a COVID uh, center, so to speak. And I don't know how many beds they squeezed in there, but that's going to be where most of the COVID patients are going to go. I think you're still going to the emergency room for now, and then they will transport the patient across from the emergency room once they stabilize them, you know, if they need to be kept in the hospital. Remember, a lot of these patients are not kept in the hospital, they're just sent home. Okay. And then there's, you know, vaccines being worked on. There's, you know, and other medications and stuff that um, what they call off-label use like that medication for malaria, you know, they're looking at and stuff like that. You know, other issues, obviously, the income loss of people who are quarantined or sick, okay? And we know the whole problem with getting toilet paper and water and food and stuff like that. And for some patients, we're getting calls now where people are running out of their regular medications. You know, people that are CHFers or stuff, they're just running out of their medications because they're afraid to leave the house and stuff like that. So there's, a, we're going to get calls that have nothing to do with COVID where people are sick just because they can't get out and get their medications or, you know, at some point, it's going to reach a, a situation where people are going to die of, say, a heart attack because they call 911 and there's no 911 because you guys are either sick or you're busy on other calls and stuff like that. And that that happens. That's what happened in Toronto with SARS is that, you know, they felt more people died from the fact there was no e effective EMS in Toronto for a couple of days than they actually died of the SARS virus. Okay. Um, so again, they're relaxing everything on PPE, not because it's good, it's because we're running out of it and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so this was something they put out the, you know, about two weeks ago saying that you could use um, simple, not a simple face mask, a surgical mask, okay, instead of a N95 respirator. But if you have enough N95s, I would definitely use that and stuff like that. So that's all this is saying here. Same thing. Okay. If you're using um, a face shield, sometimes you'll see people, it looks like a welding shield. Then you just wipe that down. You don't need to throw that away. Same thing we're doing with our goggles. Remember, if you're buying actual regular goggles, not the safety glasses, the regular goggles, those can be wiped down, you know, with the same wipes that you're using for everything else and let them air dry and then you can reuse them. So you just wipe them down. We're soaking the strap part of it in 10% uh, bleach, but the rest of it we're just wiping down. Okay. Gowns you don't need to do anything with because they're disposable, so just throw them out. Um, if you run out of gowns completely, it's a little hard to find now, but I bought a thousand um, disposable rain ponchos on Amazon. So, you know, if it really comes down to having no gowns, we were going to give people rain ponchos. And they just put something out today. I think it was Mount Sinai or one hospital in the city. They ran out and they went out and bought um, the 55 gallon trash bags. And they basically cut a hole for the, the, you know, healthcare provider's head and arms. And that's what they gave them as a gown. So, you know, if that's happening in the city where supposedly they're getting a lot of stuff, then you could imagine, you know, what's going on. Okay, so that's basically what I had on, I'm going to un unmute everybody, but that's what I had on COVID. If anybody has anything additional to add or they have any questions or anything like that, you know, we can go <laughs> Yes, Nicole. So... Um, what, uh, what do we have? Any I think you should leave everybody on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to uh, call so Frank so she doesn't beat up her kids. Go ahead. Frank, I just got a couple of questions for you. And, yes. and oh know. my God, this is never ending CME. What's that? What's that? 
What's that, Andrew? We're good. <laughs> okay. Andrew's making snide comments. All right, do me a favor, Bye. Frank. Shut him down. All right? Shut him down. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the workman's comp you were talking about, we're not getting notified. So if somebody, most of us bring in patients, we, we'll never know. Because we found out through the back door a couple of times when a patient actually had it. So you're talking about tracing back to the patient. How are we going to do that? It is difficult. It is, it is difficult. Like we got a phone call from Englewood the other day, which I thought was very nice for them. They're actually being better with notifying us than uh, Nyack and Good Sam is. I got a phone call from an emergency room doctor at Englewood who said, your crew brought down a patient with Nyack ambulance. They, so they knew everybody. Um, and that patient tested positive for COVID. So we just want to make sure you guys are aware of it so you can let your people know. And, you know, I called our crew. They had already called me and told me that they found out through the grapevine because it was a member of the service's parent um, that they found out through that member of the service that um, the father tested positive. And um, sadly, that was uh, last week where people were not as concerned, I guess, as this week. And one medic did not have a mask on. So now he's under the, um, you know, he has to wear a surgical mask and monitor himself and stuff. The other guy was fully um, suited up. It always kind of boggles my mind when, if your partner fully suits up, how you think you don't need to, but whatever. Um, but the BLS, uh, Nyack Ambulance BLS, didn't have any PPE on at all. So they had a pair of gloves on. That was it. So again, they're going to have to monitor themselves. They, everybody did go up to um, Anthony Wayne and get tested. So both our people and Nyack's uh, people. So. It is tough, but right. if you can trace it to a possible source patient, that will make the case much better. What else? All right. Now, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, the fit testing is just, uh, you know, we, there are so many different N95s, and apparently you have to be fit tested for each one. Right. We only have a small number of the 1860 from the county mm -hmm. uh, that we were fit tested for. The other two type of N95s we have, we haven't been fit tested for, nor would they be, one of them wouldn't even be effective against uh, uh, aerosol. So, uh, I mean. Well, if it's truly an N95, it has to be because that's what they're designed for. But I you're right. I will show you the box, Frank. It says okay. N95 on it, and it says what, it, what it's for. It's a 3M N95. Is it an industrial one, not a medical one? Was that it what it might was? be an industrial okay. one. So on the industrial ones, they're just as good as the medical ones, and they're actually, they got a waiver now to say that they are. Um, the problem was that since they didn't go through the FDA, FDA testing because it was so expensive, they, can't, they couldn't say back then that it was, uh, it was good for medical use. Like we had a, okay. uh, body, we had a body shop that had a bunch of uh, cases of them you know, and they just were sitting on the shelf because they went to using a, a PAPR system for when they were spraying the uh, cars. And uh, the guy called up and said, you know, can I, can I donate these to you? Now they're all expired, but I got to tell you the stuff you're getting from the County probably is expired too. Um, you know, so we took them. So now we have the same issue. Now we have five different types of N95 masks and how can you fit test people on five different masks? So what we're doing is we're fit testing everybody on the one we have the most and we're putting that out there now. And then as we see those stocks getting depleted, we're going to fit test them on the next one that we have the most amount of masks on and so on and so on and so on. Unless, you know, we get a huge stock of one particular mask from the, uh, from the, you know, feds or the county or whoever. So it is tough. Um, you know, there's no answer because, I mean, really the answer was, I, have, I hate to say it, is we should have all been more prepared. That was the problem. We should have all been more prepared and we got lackadaisical and, you know, it snuck up on us and stuff like that. And, you know, that's what we're suffering with right now. Frank? Yes. About yes, old people. Um, I'm, well, I'm looking around and, and I see that uh, for elderly people or people with, with comorbidity, morbidities, they pretty much are going to have to settle into a self-isolation lifestyle until something can be done because uh, spreading out flattening the curve is not is 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 not going to work for them they have to lower the curve otherwise they're going to get infected at, at some point it's just it's just a matter it's just statistics i so, i don't i don't disagree with you you know but um the you know the the issue is that people probably are not going to want to be um you know, to that state of, you know, self-quarantine, but that's really the only thing that will, you know, totally eradicate the, um, the virus is that if it has nobody new to infect, that, yeah. um, 
you know, it won't happen. Okay, so let's let's continue. Can you see the um, the triage um, thing that came up on the screen? Everybody's been yeah. sent that, by okay. the way, and it's in our ambulances. Okay. And so, we have an in-house protocol that follows it. Okay. So, I mean, you know, what if you read this, you know, and, and analyze it, basically every single patient you see is going to need to go to the hospital, right? Because, you know, it's so inclusive in the, in the types of patients that it includes. So unless somebody calls with a broken ankle that's under the age of, I think it was 65, I think put here, 65, um, you know, they're going to fall into this category. So we are seeing a lot of patients that probably do, are probably positive for COVID, that are having a cough and are having a fever and do feel horrible, but they're not toxic, right? They're not going to die. And, um, you know, they probably are better off staying home and treating themselves, okay, in the house than going to a hospital and exposing themselves to other patients that are sicker than they are, because there's always the possibility of picking up secondary infections in the hospital. But if they truly insist on going to the hospital, you know, you get all the way down to here, and it says, uh, the patient meets criteria for non transport or treatment in place. Okay, now, obviously, we're not offering treatment in place. So you're not saying, okay, call us back every couple of hours, and we'll come check on you and give you an albuterol treatment, and, you know, we'll give you a bag of normal saline if you're dehydrated, right? We're not doing that. So it says you're supposed to provide the patient with the, the hotline number, which is on that form, the other form, okay, and uh, the patient information handout, okay. But if the patient insists on transport, contact medical control for guidance. So I think somebody already said medical control is non-existent because they're busy, right? They weren't even so great before, okay, but they're non-existent now. And I don't know how many doctors are going to want to agree with you without seeing the patient that it's okay for that patient to stay home. So if you get down to the fact that a patient wants to go to the hospital, right now we're kind of stuck with taking that patient to the hospital. There's not much else we could really do, um, you know, in that situation. You could point out the risks of going to the hospital, you know, if you don't think the patient needs to go. But if they want to go, there's really not much you can, you know, do in that situation. So does anybody have any question on this form or anything about it? No. Okay. Okay. So the other thing that they gave us was the um, – patients not transported by EMS, okay, handout. So this is basically just a very basic, right, handout that patients get. Um, if you decide they don't need to go to the hospital and they agree with you and stuff like that, okay? So it says just some, you know, basic stuff. Um, the reason they have this under age 15, do not take aspirin is because of the, there's a possibility of a syndrome called Rye syndrome. I think it's R-E-Y-E-S. That's why you remember probably about 20 years ago, um, we stopped giving kids aspirin and it went to Tylenol. Um, so it's very rarely when kids have a viral infection, they take aspirin. They can have a neurological event occur. So they tell people not to take uh, aspirins. They also um, don't, um, they're not real big on like the Aleves and the Advils and stuff like that. They, they seem to be pushing more of the regular um, Tylenol, okay? So again, they take all their medications like they always would at home and stuff like that, and they're supposed to stay at home until they have no fever for 24 hours without their reduce, the use of fever-reducing medications. So if they go and they're afebrile, right, without a fever for 24 hours and not on Tylenol, then they're considered to be uh, safe at that point, okay? And, you know, everything else is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, what happens, here's the COVID line. Uh, it's probably better to call this one than it is the County Department of Health because people are telling me they, they very rarely answer. Um, but this is probably a better number for them to call. Okay. Um, and if By you're going to hand it to, if you're going to, if you're going to give it to them, then leave it outside, right? You know, leave it on their stoop and have them come out and get it. Um, this way you're not. By, by you the know. way, that, that, that number, uh, mm -hmm. usually during the day, it's the, they'll, they'll tell you 70 to 80 minutes. You, uh, you should t tell them to call that number at like 2 a.m. That's okay. the best time when you can get right through. Really? Because the other, well, it was night, it was, it was after 7 p.m., but I had somebody that actually called from their cell phone while I was talking to them and got right through. So I guess it was wow. luck. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Luck but, of the um, draw. I called at 3 a.m. I got right through. Okay. <laughs> okay. So any questions on anything with COVID or anything anybody wants to add? Mariella, are you still on? I am still here. So you, do you have anything based on your experiences up there? Um, well, we've been getting a lot of people that, and the whole reason that they were really pushing for the appointments was that we were getting a lot of the worried well, the right. people that were completely asymptomatic, you know, don't really know if they've been exposed, but they just wanted to get tested anyway. And it was becoming a burden on 
the nurses up there, they were wasting our supplies, they were wasting our time. And that's why the Department of Health was kind of like, you know what, no, we got to put a stop to this. You know, mm -hmm. they, they have to meet certain criteria now. Um, so they were getting a little, a little bit stricter up there. Okay. Okay, so I, have, I just have a question about um, all of our assisted living and uh, you know areas that we have. Um, I mean, I don't mean to exaggerate things, but isn't it very assumed that it's really rampant in that location, any of those locations? So if you're going in there, you're really kind of doing the full gamut with the PPE. Oh, so I'll just tell you, our policy now is that there there is no no one of our members of service can go into a hospital, nursing home, dialysis center, you know, assisted living, whatever you want to call it, and, you know, or be around a patient without full PPE on. doesn't matter what the call came in from, right. because we had somebody uh, at CityMD that came in as a heart attack. It looked like a heart attack. You know, it smelled like a heart attack. Everything right. was fine. They worked it up as a heart attack. They did not wear PPE on the husband, with the, who was not the patient, was positive for COVID and was in the waiting room with the patient when the paramedics were there, was in the ambulance with the patient on the way to the hospital. So the patient, right. you know, at that point was not COVID positive, had no flu-like complaints, was having a heart attack, but the patient was COVID positive. So right. yes, I, I think that any patient encounter right now, um, you should have full PPE on, okay? Again, in but that means, that means you're within six feet of the patient, right? So if you're talking to the patient greater than six feet away, you don't need to waste your PPE. It's only if you're actually within six feet of the patient. So if you could do a doorway assessment, speak to the patient greater than six feet away, or speak to them even better, but in, in the, you know, in the driveway on the phone, then you don't need that people. I'm in a classroom. Well, I'm really referring to those, um, I'm really referring to our facilities, not necessarily people's private houses. But if you go into some of those, you know, some of our, we have the three assisted living places and it is coming in as, you know, something that sounds unrelated to COVID. I mean, even if it's something as simple as fell out of bed, hit their head, you know, it just seems like it's running so rampant in those locations that the minute you walk into that building, right. no matter what, you should be in. So if you have enough people, so first of all, one person should have, if you're going to go in there, I would just have one person put on PPE and go and assess the situation. Okay. I wouldn't waste all the PPE. I don't know how large crews you're running, but, you know, I would just have one person go in then and with full PPE and do it that way. Um, now, there is a list of the hotspots. Are you guys getting the list of the hotspots, so to speak, of you know, as far as the places where there's a lot of no. COVID. Okay, no. so I'll send, not... that, I'll send that to you tomorrow. I don't know how we get it, but I will, as it, every day, every day when they update it, I'll send it to Pete. Okay. Frank, I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. What happens if we're running on ARDS and uh, the medic has to intubate in the field and then it, it's, I, it's like, this happened to me on Monday. Uh, I got a job in Nanuet. We went mutually to we went mutually to Nanuet with five, and uh, medic was bagging the patient when we got in there. We moved her over onto the stretcher, field intubation, went up to Good Sam, and like you know, the patient is five or two hours later. So if you have full PPE on, right, and it's fit tested and everything like that, you're protected. That's what it really comes down to. You know, if you have full okay. PPE on and it's properly fitted to you, you should have protection. You know, you shouldn't have to worry about it. I would just minimize those. I mean, we're working on a, a protocol now that we're not going to be working cardiac arrest if you don't witness the cardiac arrest. But we're just... Okay. Yeah, no, it, it, it wasn't an arrest. It was just like the, uh, the patient's end title was like 90. Mm -hmm. So they were retaining a lot of CO2. Yes. But yeah, so I mean, you know, you also have to decide, you know, if you go on a, uh, an unwitnessed cardiac arrest, you know, obviously, before you do anything, you want to check for any advanced directives, any DNRs or anything like that. Roll the patient, look for dependent lividity, right? And if there's any sign of dependent lividity, then that patient should not get worked. That means that patient's been down at least 15 to 20 minutes. And with everything else going on, you know the chances of that patient coming back anyway are so minimal that uh, that patient shouldn't be worked. True. What else? Anything else? Okay. Frank? Yes. <clears throat> It's Lara. I just have a question about cleaning the ambulance afterwards. Are we calling somebody to decon it, or are we cleaning it ourselves with the um, the bleach or alcohol wipe? You know, the well, the, wipe. the problem is you can't have a service. There are no services available to come in and decon your ambulances. They're all being we are actually Frank. Frank, we yeah. do. We have a service that comes in when it's necessary, and we're de determining 
that it's necessary. If we had, a, just like you were talking about, if that patient had to uh, be put on, uh, uh, you know, uh, albuterol or something, and there was some sort of mist, or they got very sick in that ambulance for some reason and was hacking up and couldn't keep the mask on, under those circumstances, we're bringing in a, a company that'll decon for us. We ha we did it once at the very beginning. Right. Uh, our, all our rigs have been decon, but other than that, we're just wiping everything down. Okay, I'd be surprised if that company's available. <laughs> I mean, if they're a big enough company, I'm sure they they have been sucked up, you know, by other places. But you know, if you have that ability, that's great. Um, but most places don't have a contract with anyone that they're actually coming into decon their ambulance, so it's falling onto the crew, you know, who's working to be able to decon it. Um, if you could park an ambulance for eight hours after you decon it, that I forgot to mention that, but if you could park an ambulance for eight hours after you decon it with the doors and windows open, that would be ideal. But if you can't, as soon as you wipe everything down, it could go back into service. But, uh, you know, if you want to do it ideally, you know, having it sit for eight hours would be also a benefit. But I wouldn't, I would not have, am, you know, I wouldn't take ambulances out of service for that, I guess is what I'm saying. What else? In reference to deconning, like our clothes and things like that, typical wash is fine. Yep, typical wash is fine. You don't have to bleach your clothes to, you know, the nth degree or anything like that. You know, I mean, if they're whites and you want to do a bleach load, that's fine. But yeah, I would, you know, personally, I would wash them separately. Uh, my wife has a rule that I can't bring any clothing into the house now. So, uh, you know, I have a bag of clothing in the garage that at some point is going to go to the laundry mat, or I'll wait till she's not around and wash it in the house. But um, <laughs> Yeah, that's basically her uh, her rule. And I, 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 I walk in the house now with booties on, you know, those blue booties over it, even though I'm not wearing them all day long, but it makes her feel like, you know, I'm doing my part to keep the house safe. Um, so if we're done with COVID, the problem is the quiz has some questions that I just want to review because the quiz is not so much on COVID, but which is on what we're actually supposed to have the CME on this, uh, this month. So does anybody have any other uh, COVID type uh, questions? Okay. So, you know, just recap, it's just my personal opinion. Um, and, you know, I've been friends with everybody for many, many years, but if you're, if you're older, I would strongly consider, you know, not going on ambulance calls for the time being. Okay. That's just my personal opinion. I mean, I'm being a little bit of a hypocrite because I'm still working and I'm still seeing patients and stuff like that, but I'd hate to have to go to, you know, somebody's, well, I hate to have to come to my funeral, but I would hate to have to go to anybody's, uh, you know, funeral and stuff like that. So Can you just recap, like when you say older for somebody who's fairly I'm, healthy, I'm, are 50, you about I'm, 50, like I'm 56, or? I'm 56 and I, I think I'm in pretty good health and I have no comorbidities or anything the, I'll tell you what scares me is I have a 45 year old, a 42 year old friend. Um, he was uh, patient number one at one of these Jewish schools uh, up on the <coughs> Hempstead road over there off the Palisades. So he was the patient, the only patient there. Um, and he can't trace, they could not trace his contact to anything, not to New Rochelle or not to anything. He got it, went down very hard within two days. For some reason, the family insisted on him going to Good Sam. He languished at Good Sam for three more days. Um, and then he was so bad that they paralyzed him, they intubated him, and they sent him to Westchester. He, you know, is probably not going to survive it. So he's 42 years old, no medical problems, no nothing. And he's just one of those unlucky young people who got it. So you can't, you know, statistically, again, it's people over the age of 60 with comorbidities, but, you know, you Six, get those. Five, you get, 65. Yeah, yeah, Steve. Okay, so, but uh, it makes us feel better, right? N plus one. So, um, so anyway, <clears throat> there's no way of knowing. Look, you know, it, it, you know, obviously there was a, there's an 18-year-old, you know, intubated and stuff. So there's just no way of knowing who's going to get it, who's not going to get it and stuff. But again, statistically, if you're older, you know, you're out of shape, you're not in good health, um, you have other illnesses and stuff, you smoke, you vape, those are all just raising your risk factor. Just, they were raising your risk factor for having a heart attack, right? I mean, but with this, they're raising your risk factor. So you just have to make that decision. But I'll just say to you, you know, if you're wearing <coughs> proper PPE, okay, and you don't take it off your face because you can't breathe, I mean, it's hard to work in PPE. Um, you're, you'll find you may have to, I mean, we had a situation, you know, my, one of my sons um, is home from college. He's working as an EMT at Haverstraw and Stony Point and Nyack and everything. Um, they had to carry somebody out of the house. You know, the kids are strapping, strong kid, you know, and everything like that, no problems. And he said, he called me and said, dad, I feel like I'm going to pass out. My, my mask is dripping wet. He goes, and we, you know, my partner's having a hard time helping me. 
He goes, what should I do? I said, just put the patient, they had them in the Reeves. I said, put the patient down on the ground. Okay, they said, go outside. Okay, take your mask off, catch your breath. I said, and then go back in and finish dragging the patient out. So that procedure that would have taken most of us five minutes you know, to get the patient out wound up being a 15 or 20 minute procedure for them to get the patient out. And then I said, before you go in the back of the ambulance, do the same thing. You know, I said, who's ever in the best shape should sit in the back with the ambulance, with the patient, and then everybody else should go outside, cool down, take a deep breath, because you don't want to break the seal on the mask because you feel like you can't breathe, because then all the protection up to that point is gone, right? If you were perfect for 30 minutes and you break the seal on the mask, well, that first 30 minutes was useless. So mm -hmm. it's going to take us much longer to be able to do it. And the problem is we can't practice anything because we can't waste N95 masks. So... Okay, anything else? Okay, so just real quick. So there, there's questions on the quiz about um, asthma and there's questions on the quiz about abdominal emergencies. So just from the standpoint of asthma, we know that uh, asthma is a, what they call an episodic situation where most of the times they're okay and then they have episodes when they have a problem. And it, it's a basically a uh, kind of an autoimmune response where certain triggers cause their bronchioles to tighten and to thicken. And the combination of thickening and tightening makes it harder for air to get through, okay? And these are your terminal bronchioles down towards your alveoli. So what happens is when they breathe in, because the air is coming under the pressure, they could actually open up those bronchioles and get air down to their alveoli. Their actual problem in asthma is exhaling because exhaling is passive. So there's not enough force to open up the bronchioles. So typically asthmatics have a wheeze on exhalation, okay? And the danger for asthmatics is not so much as not bringing enough oxygen in, but is to, um, not get the carbon dioxide out. That's the bigger problem they have, okay? So we have a very effective drug, which is albuterol, okay, that we could use to treat them. Just remember that you are allowed to give up to three albuterol treatments, okay, if the patient needs it, okay? And then that's all on standing order, okay? And remember, albuterol is what they call a bronchodilator because the, the disease of asthma is a bronchoconstrictive disease, so you want to reverse it with bronchodilators. And um, we we'll also have um, another medication that we could administer to patients having an asthma attack, and that's epinephrine, the EpiPen. But that is a medical control option, which means that you can't just do it on your own say-so. Albuterol is a standing order. You can give up to three doses on albuterol as a standing order, right? But EpiPens in asthma, first of all, they're going to be reserved for the dying asthmatic that can't breathe the albuterol in anymore. So they're the sickest of the sick patients, okay? And... Um, you know, you would have to call medical control. Now, we know that EpiPens have a specific weight between the adult. I know you guys are still using EpiPens, so they have a specific weight difference between the adult and pediatric, right, when you choose. So does anybody remember what the specific weight is? Uh, I'm on a conference call. 30 kilos, okay, 30 kilos or 66 pounds. So if they're over 66 pounds, they get the adult EpiPen, okay? And I always tell people it's a good idea, you know, you're supposed to have a little separate box to keep all your meds in. I would label, put a label on that box, all the different dosages and when you use them, how you use them. So like the EpiPens, I would say 66 pounds or greater, use the adult, okay? Um, and again, it's a medical control option. Now in anaphylaxis, we were talking about asthma, but in anaphylaxis is a standing order, right? Because in anaphylaxis, you don't have time to call medical control. And asthma would be so rare that you're using Epi because most of the times, you know, we've all experienced that albuterol works well. There's a question of, can you use CPAP on an asthmatic? So the answer is yes. Okay, um, it's probably not the first thing you would use. Albuterol would be the first thing you would use, but you can use CPAP, okay? And then they're asking you, what's the, the um, pressure ranges that you could use, that you would set the CPAP for? So it'd be 10 millimeters to 15 millimeters of mercury, right? So you know there's a way of adjusting your leader flow to give the different pressures, or some of them have a dial to tell you the different pressure settings. Those are the PEEP settings that you set CPAP on. There's a question on the contraindications to CPAP. Like when would we, when could we not put CPAP on people? So the first one would be if they're not wide awake. So they have to be wide awake and able to follow commands. So wide awake means their glycosylcoma scale is 15. If they're below 15, or actually the, the question says below 14, technically you can't use CPAP because they have a slightly altered mental status. You can't use it on somebody who's not breathing because it's not a ventilator. You can't so use it on somebody who's breathing very shallow and slow because at that point, the bag valve mask is the way to go. You can't use it on somebody's blood pressure is below 90, and I'll explain very briefly why. 
So when you're putting CPAP on someone, and remember, you're tightly fitting that mask to their face and everything like that. When they breathe in, they're pressurizing their thorax, right? Because they're, over, they're pressurizing their lungs, which is pressurizing their thoracic cavity. So the thoracic cavity is a closed cavity, right? I mean, it's basically, you know, you got skin and ribs and diaphragm. There's no place for, you know, anything really to go unless you have a pneumothorax. If you overpressurize the thorax, and when we talk about overpressurizing the thorax, it means that you're exceeding what's called the venous return pressure in the superior and inferior vena cava. And those are the, the big veins bringing blood back to the heart that's all used up. So those are low pressure veins. If the pressure in the chest exceeds the pressure in the superior and inferior vena cava, no blood gets back to the heart. So they say if the blood pressure is below 90 to start with, you already know there's a problem with blood flow. And if you put them on CPAP, you're just going to bottom out their blood pressure. So those would be the situations where you wouldn't want to use uh, CPAP. Okay. Um, there, and, and again, when you're taking the quiz, feel free to look things up, right? I mean, that's all learning. So, you know, if you don't know the answer, you know, you definitely can look things up um, to be able to get the right answer because you'll probably remember it better than listening to me talking about it by looking it up. Then there's some questions on abdominal emergencies. So there's a question on a, an abdominal aortic aneurysm, right? So the AAA. So a aortic aneurysm could be in the thorax, the chest, or it could be in the belly. It's more common in the belly, okay? And you know the aorta is the largest blood vessel, largest artery in the body, okay? It, it starts at the left ventricle, goes down to about your, you know, probably a little below your belly button. It bifurcates into your iliacs that then go down into your femorals and goes down into your legs. So what happens is those are high pressure vessels. And sometimes because of disease of the blood vessels, they get a weakened area on the inside of it. And the blood flow, because it's so strong, starts to dig a tunnel in that little weakened area and makes a pathway because the, the arteries have three layers and it starts working its way in between those uh, layers and you get a bulge, or like an aneurysm, which kind of looks like a car tire that gets a bubble on it. And you know, you know that if the bubble bursts, that's it for the patient. But you know, a lot of times they have signs and symptoms and pain mm -hmm. and stuff. So there's a question on what are some classic signs and symptoms. So you know, obviously, chest or abdominal pain would be one. Okay, um, lack of appetite, difficulty swallowing could be something. But the one I think that people are not so aware about is that they could complain of a leg that goes numb and cold. And what that means is the aneurysm has dissected down into their iliacs, into their femorals, down into their leg, and that leg's not getting any blood. So that's a, you know, not a super common one, it happens, but that's you know, also a sign of a uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, okay? Um, oh, just going back to the asthmatic patient as far as signs and symptoms. So I said wheezing, okay? There is a type of asthma called cough variant asthma. So instead of wheezing, they have a weak and effective cough, not a hacking cough like when you have bronchitis, but like a... <laughs> If you've ever given somebody albuterol and they start opening up and they get that little kind of weak cough, that's the same kind of cough that people with cough variant asthma get. So those patients are still treated with albuterol, but that would be, you know, a wheeze or a cough could be a sign of an asthma attack. So just you know, put that out there up for the test. Um, then going back to the abdominal aortic aneurysm. So we said that the lifeless leg, the abdominal pain, the back pain, you know, uh, are all possible um, signs of it. There's a question on appendicitis. So in EMT class, you learned that uh, an appendicitis typically manifests it with right lower quadrant pain. Okay. Um, the other place that actually the place that where the pain first starts is what's called periumbilical. So your umbilicus is your belly button. So when when a um, appendicitis first starts, the patient typically feels the pain around their belly button. And then as it gets more infected, more they call it ripe, more hot, it starts to move down to the lower right quadrant. So you could have either lower right quadrant or uh, periumbilical pain or both, okay? Uh, what else can you have? You could have fever, you could have nausea, you could have vomiting. So those are all possible signs of a appendicitis. Um, just trying to think what else there was on the test. Um, so going back to the abdominal emergencies, remember, we have no specific treatment for any abdominal emergencies. It's just what they call supportive care. Um, so if somebody, ha oh, I know there was a question on esophageal varices. Okay, so you know your esophagus is your food tube and you've heard of varicose veins in somebody's leg, right? So varicose veins in somebody's legs means that the veins have become greatly dilated typically because of pressure, right? They're overweight and they can't get the blood back up their venous blood back up through their diaphragm and their veins become distended. And if you've ever seen a varicose vein bleed it, bleed, it bleeds pretty significantly, even though it's a vein. 
So esophageal varices are those same varicose veins, instead of being in your legs, are the, on the inside of your esophagus. So what happened here is that people 99% of the time have liver disease. It's either from hepatitis or alcoholism, chronic alcoholism, uh, where they've killed their liver and their liver's gotten stiff. And the portal veins that are liver veins are actually fed from the esophageal uh, veins. So the veins become distended because it's hard to get blood through the liver, so they become distended. And what could happen at any point is that they, they start to rupture inside the esophagus. So you could picture what's gonna happen is that either the person's gonna be vomiting up bright red blood, okay, copious amounts of bright red blood, or if it's a, sm a mild bleed, it's gonna drip down into their stomach, okay, and then they're gonna be vomiting up coffee ground blood as the acid acts on the blood. So it's a bleeding problem, it's a hemorrhage problem. So severe that it could cause shock, okay? They could bleed so much and everything like that. Like when you're talking about hiring that ambulance, that company to decon your ambulance, this would be a situation where they could be spending hours and hours trying to decon it because if that patient projectile vomits up blood, you know, it's gonna get into every nook and corner of the, of the ambulance. Um, the other thing they have is nausea, they have lack of appetite, you know, and uh, difficulty swallowing when they have all this stuff. So again, we have no way of stopping the bleeding, and we have actually no way of even, you know, replacing the blood they're losing. So our, our concern would be to, you know, get them to the hospital as quick as we can and try to minimize the risk of aspiration when they're vomiting, um, you know, uh, when the patient's vomiting up the blood and stuff like that. That goes everywhere. Yes, it is. It's quite disastrous. I mean, the survival rate is pretty minimal. What they do is that um, when people are at risk for this, is they actually go down and look inside their, they do an endoscopy and they go and look down inside their um, esophagus for these bulging veins before they get real bad. And they, they basically either uh, strangle them, they put like a rubber band on them and strangle them to act like a tourniquet, or they can actually inject them with a um, medication that causes them to shrivel up so they can't rupture. So that's the better way to manage it is to preemptively get rid of them. But if they rupture, it's pretty disastrous because with all that blood that's happening, they can't go down there with the endoscopy scope and see what's going on. So it's rare. I mean, it's not, not that common anymore. Even an abdominal aortic aneurysm is not as common as it was years ago because people tend to be in better shape. Um, I think that was the main part of the question. You know, obviously there's a lot that we could go over. Um, I think I had one, let me just see if I could, um, I don't know where, oh, here it is. There was one thing I just wanted to show you and then I'll let everybody go. Uh, that was Steve, he volunteered to have the picture taken. Okay, so what we're looking at, this is your aorta, right? And here's where it bifurcates into, can you see my mouse moving on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yeah, so here's where it's bifurcating down into the iliacs, right? So this is a normal aorta, and this is a, a aorta with an aneurysm in it, okay? So here's a CAT scan that actually shows it, the aneurysm, and it's starting to work its way down into the iliacs. So if that was what it was going to happen, okay, um, that's where, you know, depending on which way it goes, or it could be both legs, would get sudden, you know, they would suddenly go numb and be cold and everything like that with that patient. Um, so why is it not advancing? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, this is a little harder to see. I don't know if you could make it out, but, you know, this would be a, a totally normal lumen, okay? And what happens is that because of the uh, disease that's going on inside the arteries, it gets a little nick on the inner wall and the blood starts to work its way and starts tearing apart the walls. So if you see down in here, how it's making like an artificial pathway and that's where they're gonna get the bulge, okay? And that's what's, when they say a dissecting aneurysm, you know, the term dissecting, like cutting apart, that's what, you know, basically happens with these, uh, these patients, okay? What makes people be able to live with, um, you know, a triple A like forever, a long time? So years ago, like I had a grandmother who had a abdominal aortic aneurysm for 20 years. And the biggest thing I can remember is being a bratty little tiny kid was going to rub grandma's belly with this big bulging thing, right? So it was probably the worst thing in the world to do, but everybody did it. Um, back then the treatment was surgical, okay? 
and the chances of surviving were pretty minimal. But now they could do it internally where they slide, I'll show you in a second, but they slide kind of an inner tube into that um, aorta, okay? And now the blood starts to go through the new tube, so there's no risk of it rupturing and then bleeding to death. So, but just so you can see, here's the CAT scan on this guy, and this is what was presenting when he was physically examined. That's pretty rare. Most of the times you don't actually see the aneurysm coming up to the surface. So there's a special way that you actually palpate for it. So you see how they're normally when we palpate, we're kind of pushing to the sides. You see how they're moving towards the midline and trying to trap the, because your aorta runs on your midline, right? Runs along your front of your spine. So when you're palpating for a abdominal aortic aneurysm, you actually have to palpate towards the midline. And if you feel a pulse when you're doing that, that would be the aneurysm, right? So that's what kind of uh, happens. Um, again, limb ischemia, limb ischemia is a good um, sign and symptom, right? The pulsating mass is 100% diagnosis, right? Unless you have a very thin person and you just really push really, really hard, you may be able to palpate their aorta and they don't have an aneurysm, but most of us you know, are not that thin, okay? Difference in pulse strengths, if it's a thoracic one in your arms or um, in your lower extremities um, in your legs and also blood pressures would be slightly different between right and left, okay? And in the hospital, you do an ultrasound, CT scan or CT angiogram to make the complete diagnosis. So here's a guy who had one. When they opened it up, that was the aneurysm. So you have to figure his aorta should be about the size of a garden hose. So look at the size of it. So that's basically a ticking time bomb. In the old days, when they did open surgery, what they basically did was pack him in ice at this point, right? And they would clamp above and below the aorta. And then they would basically sew in a new piece of, I don't know what they make it out of, but say Teflon, uh, a new, new piece of artery in there, okay? So they used to run a, a stopwatch because, you know, obviously if it took too long, the patient's lower extremities, they would be paralyzed. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't a perfect uh, match. Now what they have is they basically cannulate pretty much like everything. They go in through your groin into your uh, femoral artery, just like if they're doing angioplasty or something like that. Uh, there is um, the ability now with angioplasty for your heart to go in from your wrist, which tends to have less complications. But, you know, they go in from your groin. So here's the aneurysm. They bring a tube up past the aneurysm up into a good part of the aorta. And then they basically pull back and a, the tube kind of rises like a stent, it kind of inflates itself. And now the blood flow, okay, goes through the new tube and the aneurysm has no blood going through it. And eventually it just kind of falls back down onto the um, to device. So this is kind of a thing that they could do in someone and they could be leaving the hospital like in a day, just like with uh, angioplasty. So. Um, now, I don't know that we do that in Rockland County. That might be a Westchester or a Hackensack, but uh, that's the new, you know, the new way that they kind of manage it. This was esophageal varices. This is the varice, the bulge. This is, look, you know, this tube in here is your esophagus, and that's the varice or the vein that's bulging, and this is what would rupture and bleed. And this is the procedure where they kind of go in and, um, let me see if I can get this slide thing to work. I don't know why it's not working. Look at it. Okay, but um, they would go in, I'll pull it out of the way here for a second. They would go in, okay, and basically put this tube over the varice, so over this, okay, and then they press a button, this, bl this blue rubber band goes and wraps around the head of the varice and acts like a tourniquet. And over a period of a couple of hours, it basically gets tighter and tighter and tighter and kind of acts like a tourniquet and deprives blood flow up into the varice and eventually the varice just scars over and heals. So again, with an endoscopy, you could see the, the varicose vein in the esophagus here. That's another varice. So you could see how big this one is, that if they were even swallowing food at this point, which would be very painful, okay, it would be, it could rupture at any, any point. Um, so that's really basically what I wanted to show you. I thought I had something on asthma. Frank, getting back to my question though, people actually do have these and live years yes. with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then they. But could now, but they like that's. I guess I got off it for a second. What I was going to say is years ago, so there there's a a measurement, right? I mean, so if it's small, they will watch it, and people will go for a CAT scan every year. But once it gets to a certain point, then they have to make a decision. So 
if they recommended surgery, I would get a second opinion, right? Because that means the place that you went to for the recommendation, they don't do the endovascular repair. They only do open surgery. Um, and you have to realize hospitals are in it to make money. So if you go to a hospital that only does one thing one way, they're not going to tell you to go someplace that there's a better way of doing it because then they're not going to get the money. So you always need to be like the informed consumer. So yes, there could be people who live with it. Okay. There's people who have aneurysms in different parts of their body and live with it and uh -huh. stuff like that. It's just a question that has to be monitored and patients have to be informed of the signs and symptoms that they should be looking for. But if it needs to be worked on, then it would probably be an endovascular repair. Remember, we could all have an aneurysm in our brain right now, right? It's more common in women that they get what's called a AV malformation in their, in their brain. So an AV malformation is that arteries and veins should never meet. In between an artery and vein should be a capillary bed, okay? And what happens is, you know, arteries are high pressure. So when blood goes through a capillary bed, the pressure is dissipated before it goes into the vein. If an artery and a vein are attached, then that high pressure artery is sending the blood into a, 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 what should be a low pressure vein and the vein could rupture and can develop an aneurysm, a bulge, right, where they meet. And that's what, you know, can happen. That's why a lot of times you hear these young women who have, you know, all of a sudden have a blinding splitting headache and then, you know, they, they posture and they're dead. They probably had an undiagnosed AV malformation that turned into an aneurysm. And it happened, uh, it, um, we had an EMS. We had a situation where Nyack Ambulance was responding to a call in the tiered parking lot of the Nanuet Mall. Boy, do I remember that call. Okay. And uh, the guy who was driving did not realize that a box ambulance does not fit into the tiered parking lot of the Nanuet uh. Mall. So the box hit, the female EMT in the passenger seat hit her head on the dash and she was dazed. You know, she wasn't badly hurt, but everybody insisted she go get checked out. So they did a routine CAT scan at NIAC and they found out she had a fairly large aneurysm in her head that she didn't even know about. And she had it repaired, okay, surgically repaired. Um, but if she didn't know about it, right, it would have continued to grow until it ruptured. So, I mean, I don't Luckiest want everybody to- woman ever. What's that? Luckiest woman ever. Yes, so that doesn't mean we all have to go for CAT scans, but I'm just saying, you know, so that's kind of what happens with the AV malformations. Okay, so I don't want to keep anybody any longer because I kept you longer than I thought. It's almost, it's after nine now. Does anybody have any questions on anything that you want to talk about? Okay, I will stay on if somebody's embarrassed to ask questions while everybody else is, wants to get off. Um, just for my own knowledge, was this a good way of doing it? Was it clear? Did it make sense? Were we getting the information across and everything like that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it was good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a good presentation to have your uh, screen up while you talk as well. Okay. So I will. Um, I'm not sure I really like the idea of seeing Rob and, and Bill in bed, but that's another story. I said so, don't have to walk. So I have to tell you that some of the, this, you guys have been fairly benign, but uh, some of the other ones I've done have been pretty interesting. There was one guy who was continually picking his nose. I mean, actually tunneling in. <laughs> And I, I, he didn't have his name up, so he just had his phone. So it was like Samsung one two three four or something. So I was like, "Listen, Samsung one two three four, you're breaking every COVID rule known to man <laughs> by taking your dirty hands and sticking them up your nose and then licking it and stuff." So all of a sudden, his picture disappeared, ah. everything disappeared and stuff like that. So, uh, but that's you know. Sheltering in place, buddy. Yeah. So. Why are you all dressed up, Steve? Um, yes. Yeah, I was riding. You look pretty professional. Okay, so let me know also some you feedback. Did what? So, nice. Be nice. Um, oh, who said, all right, who okay. said that? Who said that? You're going to okay. get fucked. <laughs> I, 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 we're Jeez. taping. We're taping. Oh, easy. Sorry. Sorry. Easy, buddy. Okay. Um, so, so just some feedback also, if you can, on, the, on the, um, the quiz. Let me know if it was too hard, you know, or anything like that. And, uh, you know, just in general, how you think it is, because, you know, obviously for at least the next three to six months, this is probably the way we're going to be doing it. Um, like I did say, for those who signed in later, there is some strong rumors going around the state is going to extend certifications. Um, but, uh, you know, we still need to continue doing what we need to do. So this might be an easy way. I will um, have it taped and I will send the link to uh, to Steve and to um, Peter. Pete. Okay, so they could send it out. And, um, you know, after the CME, Pete is going to, uh, I'll give him a list of everybody who attended, and he's going to send out um, a copy of the, or a link to the exam for you guys to take. And then you will get a, if you pass it, you will get a immediate being able to save the certificate or print the certificate. And I'll also get a copy, and that's how we're going to keep track of your, you know, your CME the, moving forward. The fire department canceled all um, 
uh, refreshers for everybody. The only the only staff right now in the fire department that are working are the paramedic training program, the cadet program, and uh, uh, research and development. Everybody else is out in the street. So, right. And uh, in a in an odd turn of events, the website Pornhub donated twenty five thousand procedure masks to the union to be given to our members. So everybody, every one of our members can come in and get a box of uh, procedure masks from Pornhub. Well, I, I, okay, I don't know what's quite to say about it. maybe the maybe your member, maybe your members were the largest consumer of Pornhub's uh, you know uh, education, and they're just returning the favor. I don't know. <laughs> Pornhub. Okay. I heard they were creating shirts that said, "The longer this gets, the harder we go." <laughs> okay, guys. So, does anybody have any questions? It's still on people. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, does anybody have any questions? I'm going to have to edit this. Does anybody? I'll give it, Drew. I'm going to send it to you to edit. Um, does you anybody have any it's questions? I, I got it. Okay, thanks. Does anybody have any questions <laughs> on anything medically relevant to what we were discussing, or anything in general before we end it? Just one quick question. Oh, yes. Joan Marie, okay. you're being that person now. We got to go. <laughs> Joan, you already <laughs> got it, dog. Relax. Steve was only interested in whether we were talking about porn. Goodbye, Steve. <laughs> okay. Have you had any reciprocity with the uh, attached states instead of doing national certification? No, no but there was last week, there was a rumor that they were going to accept nationally registered uh, paramedics with immediate uh, reciprocity, which you can get it, it's just a process, but they were gonna say if you sent them a card, they were gonna tell you that the card is good for X amount of months. Um, okay. so. The National Registry actually expires on the 31st for application. Right. That's why I was bringing that up. Yeah, so I don't know, I, have to, I actually uh, renewed my National Registry in, in January, so I haven't looked since then. I don't know if they've done any um, extension. Somebody told me they did, but I didn't look. They extended it for another 30, Six days. Thirty-six days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think you're going to see that pretty much. Um, you know that everybody's going to wind up extending, or they're not going to have anybody that's able to to do it. The other thing, like I said, is they're talking about giving a provisional certification to people who were paramedics or EMTs previously and let their card expire. They're trying to figure out how long the person had to be expired. Do they want them to have a medical director approval and stuff like that? But you may be able to go and recruit amongst. Um, you know, members or old members uh, that their cards expired and see if they want to, you know, come back. Uh, but they haven't really worked anything. You know, there's nothing definitive yet. It's all just discussion, um, you know, that way. Okay, so it was nice seeing everyone. And I guess we'll reconvene in a month. In the meantime, I don't, I don't know who's next for a CME, but I will send it to Pete, the link and everything. So you guys, if you want to participate in that one, you can. And if you have any suggestions, you know, how to make it better or any suggestions or things to talk about, I'd appreciate it. And uh, if not, then everybody can uh, go get some rest. So Thank we'll... you. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Take care. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <clears throat>